Good evening and welcome to uh, Illinois Learn to Hunt presents a webinar on woody plants for Illinois hunters. Um, and just a, a quick overview and a, a few reminders before we um, we get started. Uh, throughout this webinar, your, your webcams and your microphones are disabled, so you don't have to worry about those kicking on it at any time. But if you do have questions, um, you can either utilize the chat window or you can also use a, a Q&A feature that you should see on your device. And um, as you ask those questions, we'll, we'll try to answer them as quickly as we can. Um, and if we don't get to get to all your questions during the, the main portion of the webinar, we should have a, a few minutes at the end um, to wrap up with some some question and answer. So if we don't get to it uh, during the, the presentation, we'll, we'll try to get to them um, there at the end. Another reminder, um, after th this webinar concludes in the next few days, we'll, we'll send out a recording of this webinar. So if you have to take off early, you will still get a full recording of this. We'll go ahead and upload that to YouTube and provide you a link for that as well. Um, we'll also send out in that, that same email, we'll send out a copy of the PowerPoint slides because there is some, some good information there. And we'll also add some additional resources that we think will, will help you in your, your plant identification. Um, but with that, um, I want to quickly go over what we're going to talk about today. Um, first, we're going to start off with a, a quick overview of some, some basic plant terminology. And you'll kind of see as we go through this presentation, there will be some times we use some, some various uh, botanical terms. And so we'll, we'll go ahead and set the stage up front early and identify those terms so that as we go through the, the remainder of the webinar, um, you, you should be able to follow. Then after that, we're going to dive right into to plant species overview. Uh, we'll first start off with, with kind of a, a quick overview of plants that you should be aware of. Um, so these are typically plants that can cause you a little bit of damage, whether it's poison ivy or some of the other thorny plants that, that we'll cover. Then we're really going to dive into to nut bearing species. Um, so that's going to be your oaks and your hickories. And we're going to dive deep into to how to tell the differences between the two, but also how you as a hunter can use this information in your hunt planning process. Um, being able to, to identify plants and identify trees is a, a huge component of hunting and it's often overlooked, but it can be really advantageous for your, your scouting efforts, as well as your, your hunt planning um, efforts. Uh, so with that, my name is Dan Stevens. Um, I'll be presenting tonight alongside of Adam Wojciechowski. If Adam, you wanna say hello. How's it going everyone? Thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks Adam. And we also have Curtis Twellman tonight. Curtis, if you wanna say hi. Good evening folks. Excellent. And Curtis uh, went out and uh, recorded a, a few videos for us earlier this week before we got <laughs> dumped with rain and wind. Um, so we're going to try to play some of those videos throughout the, the presentation today. Um, if there are some some issues with the with those videos when the recording is, is put up live, uh, the, those issues should be rectified. But we tested it out beforehand and it seemed to work out pretty well. So fingers crossed. Uh, but with that, and uh, one more reminder I want to mention, we can't always monitor our audio level. So if, if you're having issues with audio, please just uh, drop it in the chat and let us know if, if one of us drops out or something. That way we can get that, uh, get that rectified pretty quickly. But now, uh, like I mentioned in the overview, we're just going to dive right into some basic terminology that we're going to use throughout this presentation. And this is really kind of the, the fundamental building block blocks of being able to identify plants and identify trees. And so first we're going to start off with a quick conversation about various leaf types. Um, Cause you know, if, if you're new to, to understanding uh, botany and understanding plants, if you look at it, say this leaf here, that's the black walnut, you may look at that entire structure and say, well, that's a, a branch with many leaves coming off of it. But in reality, this entire structure is one leaf. And so that's what we're going to work to identify right now is what are these different leaf types. And so the, the most basic and arguably the most common, it's what's going to be found on, on cottonwoods, on oak uh, trees, on maple is going to be a simple leaf. And so this is just an un, a, a simple leaf. It's just a leaf um, with an undivided blade. So it doesn't have these leaflets. And so if you look at this, what we kind of term is a compound leaf, you can see, again, this entire structure is the leaf and these are leaflets that are coming off of this this stem we also have a palmately compound um, which you can see down here in the bottom we do have a, a bunch of illustrations and plant species that that will fit each of these leaf types that we'll go over a little bit later but again we just wanted to get you a little bit familiar with the, the terminology before we dive too far in so in essence a simple leaf is just going to be one leaf off of the twig a compound leaf is going to have many leaflets on an individual leaf um, if that makes sense up next is leaf arrangement. And so this is how the leaves are arranged on the plant or in this case on the tree. And so there's several different leaf arrangements. 
Um, the, the two most common that, that you're going to see readily are going to be opposite or alternate leaf arrangements. And so that, that's pretty easy to identify once you start to know what you're looking for. And so it's all about where the individual leaf comes off of the branch. And so here you can see we essentially have one leaf per node on alternate and on opposite, we have two leaves per node. And so you basically have a, a, this opposite effect. Um, opposite leaf arrangement is very indicative of, of several families. And so you can see here at the bottom right picture, this is actually a picture of a red maple, um, but maples are oppositely leaf arranged. So if you look at the leaf arrangement, you can see you have two simple leaves coming off of the exact same node. Where on an oak, you can see here, we only have one leaf coming off of one node and you can see how these leaves kind of alternate along the stem. And so that's where that term alternate leaf arrangement comes from. Another leaf arrangement that, that you don't see too common, but it is present on a, a number of species is world. And so this is going to be three or more leaves per node. And you can kind of see it often comes in forms like a, a, a buckeye leaf kind of looks like where it's got, you know, three or four or five leaves coming off of an individual node. But again, the two most common that you're going to see very commonly are going to be the alternate where you have that one individual leaf coming off of a node and they alternate along the stem or the opposite where you have two leaves per node. Another very important leaf characteristic that you'll hear us use a lot is looking at the leaf margin. So what does the outer margin of that leaf look like? And again, all of this is useful as to how we can identify that plant. Um, so first we have entire. So you can see this is kind of a smooth margin. There's no serrations or tooths along the margin. Then we have singly tooth. So it kind of just looks like your standard saw blade. Um, some people also call this a serrated, excuse me, or a singly serrated uh, leaf margin, uh, but you can just kind of view it as singly tooth. And then we also have a doubly serrated or a double tooth, which essentially is a single tooth, but the single tooth also has tooths inside of it. So you can see every, you know, ha it has two, basically two tooths per, per big tooth, for lack of a better term. Um, the, the next one is going to be lobed. And this is one we'll spend a, a lot of time on, especially when we get to the oak leaves. Mo the majority of, of Illinois oaks are going to have lobed leaves. And so this is kind of what that looks like, is it's not, it's not entire, it's not serrated, because it's got kind of these rounded lobes. So it's not singly tooth or doubly tooth, but it's going to be lobed. But now that we got that out of the way, I'm going to turn it over to Curtis, and he's going to dive right into some of these plants that can be a little harmful or a, a little itchy and, and things that, that we just need to be aware of when we're out in the woods. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So uh, we definitely don't aim to scare you, but, um, you know, don't be scared, be prepared. There's a couple of plants out there in Illinois that uh, that um, seem like they want to hurt you. So not quite as bad as the desert, but um, certainly a couple things to keep in mind. And here on this next slide, we're going to jump right into the honey locust. Now, this is a tree with, that with just gnarly thorns. I mean, if you look down in that lower right picture there, um, obviously the thorns are stout, stout enough that they can pierce waders or denim, or a lot of different materials. So if you bump into one of those in the dark, uh, it's liable to ruin your weekend. So definitely want to keep in mind uh, where your honey locusts are. But when you get around all those uh, thorny, ouchy um, things, what you do have left is a tree that, that does provide value for wildlife. So you see in that illustration in the top, those bean pods, um, those can provide a, a food source for different wildlife. And um, one thing that's going to stand out to you when you're trying to ID honey locust, when we get leaves on, which obviously we're not quite there yet, but another two or three weeks here, um, uh, honey locust has one of those pinnately or bipinnately compound uh, leaves. So it's real distinctive. You see those little bitty small leaflets that are only, you know, maybe the size of your finger um, and a whole bunch of them on, on a single leaf. So, um, and honey locusts actually will sometimes be bipinnately compound where off of one of those stems will be another little stem and little bitty leaflets off of that. So 
pretty cool, pretty easy to tell. Uh, in the fall and winter, you'll see those persistent bean pods, which can help you uh, to tell what it is. And if you see any of these in town, they do, um, you know, if you pay a few extra dollars, the horticulturists do have some varieties where they've bred the thorns right out of those. So you you can see some of these that are safe, but certainly if you see one out in the wilds, assume that it's uh, it has ill intent. This next tree is pretty similar to the honey locust, locust tree as well, but a black locust. So a little bit more friendly. This guy still has thorns and I, you can't really see it, but in that lower right picture, um, it, there are branched thorns kind of along the branch. And so they are woody, uh, they're stout. So they're thorns that are um, have enough rigidness to get through denim or waders or something like that. So certainly something to keep in mind, but uh, definitely not nearly the number of thorns as a honey locust, and they don't typically have the thorns growing right out of the trunk. Um, but the, the little leaflets here on the leaves are a little bit larger, and black locust is never bipinnately compound. It's always just pinnately compound. So the, the, leaves, the leaves do look similar, but a little bit different. Uh, and, and then the bark is a little bit darker and has more of that sort of diamond pattern that you might see in like an ash tree than the honey locust, which is a pretty smooth type bark. Now we're going to get into one that everybody knows. And, and pretty much if, uh, I don't know, if you go camping or you go anywhere, Anytime a ball goes out of the mowed grass into the uh, the weeds, somebody says, oh, that's poison ivy. Every every little um, bush is poison ivy. Um, and I guess it's, it's better to be safe than sorry, but um, there's certainly a lot of things out there that aren't uh, toxic to us, but poison ivy is one you should know. And the first thing you should notice about that when the leaves are on, which again, we're not quite there yet, but uh, leaves of three. And so the cute little rhyme, leaves of three, let it be. Uh, if you just remember that, that's going to bring you a long ways. But you can also kind of see how the uh, edges have those really large sort of tooth. So not a small tooth pattern, but sort of an irregular pattern on there. And um, poison ivy has a chemical called urachiol which is what causes the severe uh, rash that can spread on people. And some people are really sensitive to this and some people are not uh, too sensitive. And, and also some people change throughout their life. So I, I've known of people who never got poison ivy all through their childhood, but then at some point in adulthood, uh, they finally got it. So definitely something to keep in mind. And, and you can get these oils even when the green foliage isn't there. Up in this top uh, picture there, you see the, the vine adhered to the, the trunk there. Um, and yeah, I see the, the comment, don't be a dope, don't grab the hairy rope. Uh, that's, that's good advice because even when those, uh, that green foliage isn't there, that chemical can still be present and it can spread onto you and then it can spread onto other people you touch. And uh, if you do come into contact with poison ivy or if you think you've come into contact with poison ivy, the best thing to do is to right away or as soon as you can to wash off with uh, soap and water and you can really reduce the amount of, of rash or even eliminate what you're going to get because uh, that oil has to kind of sit on your skin for a little bit for most people for that reaction to take place. And um, this is also an important plant for wildlife. So it's it's not just one we need to be aware of and, and stay away from, but uh, you should actually be happy if you've got this on your property. Um, the little white berries that, uh, that pops up are an important wildlife food source. And also uh, other critters will browse on it, even deer. And uh, which is another little tip. I also know another guy who's super sensitive to poison ivy actually got poison ivy from uh, field dressing a deer. So got into those stomach contents and uh, the oil was in there and he got a severe poison ivy 
uh, reaction after after field dressing a deer. So definitely one to, to know, keep in mind, and just remember that little rhyme, leaves a three, leave it be. And that will really help you with this next very common plant that looks very similar to poison ivy and even uh, um, you know poison ivy turns that beautiful red color like you see in this Virginia creeper they even kind of turn that same reddish color late in the season so um, but count the number of leaves one two three four five. Oh man I'm not great at math but I know that's not three so this is not poison ivy there's no chemical on there that's uh that's known to make anybody break out. So this plant here is pretty safe. We put it in this section just because it's a very common, um, it's commonly confused for poison ivy, but this luckily is not a plant that really wants to hurt you. Uh, I guess unless if you, you get tangled up in it and trip, uh, which, which could happen, which might not be fun, but I guess that might be, might be our fault rather than the plant. But uh now we'll move on this next plant here. We're getting back into uh, something else that wants to hurt you. So the exact same uh, chemical compound that's in poison ivy uh, is also in poison sumac. So this is not very common in Illinois at all. You can find it in a couple little pockets, mostly up there in the, the northern uh, part of the state there. Um, real low marshes, swamps, uh, boggy type area and it's a uh, this one's more of a small shrubby tree so uh, more like smooth sumac if you're familiar that grows everywhere we'll show a picture of that here later but but this one actually does have that urishiol so um, again if you come into contact or if you think you've been in a area where you could have come into contact you're going to want to wash that off as as soon as you can All right, now when we get into, some of y'all might be rabbit hunters, quail hunters, uh, squirrel hunters walking through the brushy draws. Uh, some of these next plants are gonna be all too familiar to you. Uh, Greenbrier, definitely one to know. Um, uh, if you look there, it has that real shiny, um, real shiny appearance to it, real, uh, a lot of reflectance coming off of it. It almost looks plastic, like a plastic plant. So when the foliage is coming in, that's a real good sign. Whether it's in or not in though, these vines are covered with these little thorns and uh, this stuff can grow pretty thick. So uh, it's real good cover. A lot of times there will be rabbits and stuff hiding up in there, but um, yeah, you're gonna want some nice thick uh, chaps or some thick pants before you start walking through this stuff. Um, it's it's basically found all over the place. Uh, anywhere that there's rabbits, you can find greenbrier. This next one is really similar, but even worse, I think, multiflora rose. So rose family, yeah, we got the got the beautiful flowers in the spring, and maybe you'll be out turkey hunting and get a chance to see them and enjoy that. Because uh, for the rest of the year, you're not going to find too much uh, happiness in this plant, especially when you get tangled up into it uh, trying to chase a bunny rabbit. But um, another one that's really bad to walk through, one that really seems to grab a hold of you and just it's hard to get out. Um, Man, yeah, it's it can be quite comical when you get some uh, people with questionable athletic abilities trying to walk through this stuff. Um, yeah, it's it's straight out of a cartoon. So, um, but yeah, look at the leaves or alternate compound. Uh, got five to nine leaflets on there. When the flowers are coming out, obviously that stands out pretty good, but. Mostly what you're gonna notice about this is just the horrible thorns and the uh, the ability for this invasive to kind of take over an area. So uh, this is one that in certain areas, it's good to try to knock it back and let some of those native plants um, try to thrive in there, but it's, it's a tough battle with this one. Very, very aggressive. I'm going to jump in for just a second, Curtis. Uh, there's one more thing I, I kind of want to highlight about this specific plant. 
If you look right here, sorry, I am not very good at drawing with a mouse. I apologize. But if you look right where I kind of circled, you see this, this stipular spine. And you can see how it's kind of frayed off and, and kind of frays in different directions. There are a few native uh, roses that we have here in Illinois. Now, they do not have that, that same tendency to, to have this be kind of, you know, serrated and torn apart. It's going to be a, st a single structure. So if you do ever come across a rose and you're just curious whether it's this kind of invasive exotic multiflora rose or one of our native roses, that's kind of a, a quick test right there is just to, to quickly look at this, this kind of stipular area right here and see whether it's fringed or whether it's going to be a, a solid and kind of whole structure. But now we'll dive right into oaks. Um, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time here tonight. Um, this is arguably one of the, the more important tree families of, you know, in, in terms of, of wildlife benefit in Illinois, especially for, for game species. And since, again, this is kind of focused for hunters, that's where we're going to spend a, a lot of time today. So oak trees are, are very hardy trees that on average have very long lives. They're going to produce acorns that are going to be readily consumed, like I mentioned by deer, by turkey, by squirrels, um, by a, a lot of waterfowl species. Um, so they're just a, a readily available food source that, that's just kind of right there. Now there's a ton of different oak species that, that are in Illinois and, and across the country. But what we're gonna do when we first start off is just kind of go over the, the two big groups. And so you can break the, the oak family or the oak tree group into two subgroups. The first one is going to be the red oaks and the second one is going to be the white oaks. Now that might seem a little confusing because there is a species called white oak, but there's also a group called the, the white oaks. And so we're just going to speak to them at, right now as, as that group. So the white oak group are really important, again, wildlife foods, but the, the main difference between the two groups, and we'll show you how to identify between the two groups in the next slide, but the big distinction is when wildlife are using and how they are using them. So white oaks have a one year acorn maturation. So it takes an acorn on a, a white oak tree, one growing season to produce and drop that acorn. Now on the red oaks, it's gonna take two years for that acorn to mature. So it has to go through two growing seasons. And if you think about you know, why that's advantageous ecologically and evolutionarily for that specific red oak, um, it makes it a lot more drought in, in drought or, or water tolerant. And so, you know, if we have a year where it's just a, a very dry spring and there's not a, a ton of, of rain and it's tough for things to grow, well, you're going to see a significant decline in the white oak acorn production. However, the red oaks are still going to be producing acorns because, again, they've already gone through, they have already have acorns that have gone through one solid growing season. And so those are kind of the, the things to think about when you're hunting is it's not just identifying, oh, that's an oak tree. It, it's kind of, okay, is that a red oak or is that a white oak? Because um, again, that, that's really important. Now, taking it a, a step further, the white oak acorn is the, the preferred acorn um, for a lot of different wildlife species. Uh, deer, turkey, um, squirrels, they all prefer white oak acorns over red oaks. However, the red oaks are, are higher in this tannic acid content. And that's, again, why they're not as palatable and not kind of that that first choice for, for many of the, the game wildlife species. But that tannic acid, again, has a unique advantage. It allows those acorns to stay a little bit more viable on the ground for a longer duration of time. Um, not only do the, the white oaks get consumed rather quickly, but the white oaks also have a tendency to, to rot on the ground a little bit quicker, again, because they have that lower tannic acid content. And so those are kind of the things I'm thinking about. You know, if we take it from an example of a deer hunter, you know, maybe we just did not have a good white oak acorn production and I'm starting to see, you know, red oaks really start dropping in, in kind of, you know, mid to late October. Well, that's going to tell me that I'm probably going to shift away from focusing on white oak areas. You know, maybe I have an area that's a big white oak flat and it has, you know, five or 10 really big white oaks that has been producing acorns for a few years. Um, and it seems to typically be a good spot, but maybe we had a, a bad growing year. And so that's when you can kind of rely on that two year growing season of the red oak group. Um, I should highlight that it's the red oaks aren't producing acorns every two years. It's still producing acorns every single year. It just takes two growing seasons for that acorn to, to fully produce before it's going to be dropped and be consumed. So now the next logical question is, okay, how do we tell the difference between a white oak and a red oak? The easiest way is to look at the leaves. Um, and now it, you know, at first glance, you might think, well, 
you know, normally we're hunting in the fall and winter and, you know, leaves are starting to fall off. Not all trees are still holding leaves. Oaks have a, a fairly unique tendency to retain their leaves a little bit longer than most other trees. Um, even if you were to go out today and go in the woods, while you'll still see a lot of oaks with the majority of their, their leaves off, they are still going to be some leaves in that tree that can hopefully help you identify whether it's a red oak or a white oak. So for looking at this graphic here, um, on the left, this is a, a red oak. You can see how it has these bristle tips coming off the, the, the leaf. Let me, I've got something popped up. Okay, sorry about that. So if you're looking at the leaf and it kind of comes to a, a, a sharp point and has the, what looks like little hair-like projections coming off the, the leaf tips, those are referred to as bristle tips. That's going to be present on all of the red oak trees. So any tree that's in this red oak group is going to have these, these bristle tips that are coming off of the leaf tips. Where your white oaks are gonna be a much more uniform, much smoother lobe, um, not any true points, and again, they're not going to have the bristle tip. Now, as we get a, a little bit further, uh, we'll, we'll go over a few oak species that, that look nothing like these oak leaves that, you know, there's a few species where um, a, a leaf just looks like a, a circle. But if you look at the very tip of that, that leaf, it is still going to have a bristle tip because again, it's in the red oak group. So just because it doesn't look like your standard oak leaf, even if it's a red oak, it will still possess that bristle tip at the, the tip of the leaf lobes. So now we'll dive into to some basic uh, species overview for oaks. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, white oak is kind of the, the holy grail for, for many hunters in Illinois and across the Midwest. It can be found in a variety of soils. It can be in either moist or dry woods. It can be on wooded slopes. Um, it, it's just one of those trees that, that you can just kind of find in a lot of different soil conditions. Now, the, the big giveaway with the white oak, and we have a, a short video that we'll play in a little bit that'll show the, the bark a little bit closer, but the bark is going to be a very light gray to almost white coloration, um, and it almost starts to look a little bit platy. And so if you've ever heard of the tree shag bark hickory, where it kind of looks like that, you know, the, the bark is just slowly peeling away from the trunk of the tree, big mature white oaks have the, the same tendency to, to do that as well. Um, again, since it's an oak, it has a simple leaf, so it, it's not a compound leaf. It's going to be one leaf per node, and they're going to be alternating across the stem. And so if you ever get to a tree and you're, you're trying to identify it and it looks alternate, that gives you an indication that it could be an oak. Now, there are plenty of species that are also alternate, but that's kind of the thought process to go through when you're trying to identify a tree. Look at the leaf, try to see if you can see the fruit and then try to see what that leaf, how it's arranged on the stem and also look at that margin. So in this case, again, these are going to be alternate, simple leaves. Um, and the, the top and the underside of the leaf is, is fairly smooth. Now, one thing I, I wanna highlight before we get too much further is when you're trying to identify a tree utilizing the leaves, there are several different types of leaves on a tree. And so the, the easiest distinction is you can kind of view it as a sun leaf versus a shade leaf. And so your sun leaves are very oftentimes, they're gonna be on the outer edges of the tree. They're going to be the ones that are getting a lot of sunlight. And so evolutionarily, they become smaller. They don't need as much surface area to gather as much light. So those leaves that are on the inside of the tree or towards the bottom that are kind of more in the shade, those are going to be much bigger leaves. And they also might have different kind of lobe patterns than those on the sun. And so when I'm trying to identify a tree, I'm going to try to find both a shade leaf and a sun leaf, just so you have those to, to compare. But this is your, your standard white oak. You can see it's just kind of a, a very simple lobe. Um, there's no bristle tip, so that lets me know that it's a white oak. It's gonna have, again, that very white trunk with the platy bark coming off of it. Wow, we're here in the upland still. And look at this specimen as the geese come in to roost here. Here we're looking at a white oak. A really good tree to know for all hunters and, and for all wildlife enthusiasts. White oaks are generally the preferred uh, acorns. And this one actually has some persistent leaves up there hanging on. We can zoom in and, and get a look at those shape. We'll see that it's the classic uh, white oak. Uh, leaf shape up there so no bristle tips on those and the bark very diagnostic sort of patchy looks a little bit tattered really stands out 
And of course, this is a real big mature specimen that's no doubt uh, fed countless of critters here in, in central Illinois. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, so you can see in that video that again, this bark is a, a very light gray. And like Curtis mentioned in the video, it's very splotchy. You can see you have, you know, very white and smooth patches versus dark patches. That's very common. And like I, like I mentioned, you can still see that there is still a lot of leaves being retained on these trees. And that, that's very standard across a lot of the oak species is that, again, they're a hardy species. And so they, they tend to carry their leaves a little bit longer throughout fall and winter. Now, the next one I want to talk about is the pin oak. Um, now, this is one that you're going to see if you're on a college campus, if you're at a church, a local city park. This is the oak tree that it seems like every horticulturist seems to plant in a lot of green, urban green spaces. And a lot of that is just due to the, the way the tree forms. And so you can just kind of look at this picture here in the top right. And that is about as, as typical of a pin oak as, as you're, <laughs> you're, you're ever going to see. Um, and one of the unique things about pin oaks is that they don't get a ton of, of big branches like some of the other oak species. And so if you can look through, you know, this tree and just kind of look at some of these, even some of these lower branches that oftentimes on a mature white oak will get very big and very robust. Um, they're still very slender in this stage, even at a, a fairly mature tree. And so that's kind of one reason why they're advantageous for urban planting, but also they look pretty. Um, the branches typically all come horizontal off the, the trunk of the tree at the very bottom, so it, it leaves a lot of space to walk underneath and that sort of thing. Uh, but this is a, another really good wildlife food source. And again, this is what a typical pin oak leaf is going to, to look like. And so you can see here, it's going to have points that are coming off it, and it's also going to have bristle tips because this is a member of the red oak group. And the, the one way I like to, to define a, a pin oak is by looking at the depth of the, the sinus cavities in this leaf. And so these, what I'm kind of tracing here with my mouse is what we refer to as kind of the sinus cavities that are kind of encroaching inside of that, that leaf. Um, and you can see how close those, those sinuses come to the mid vein of the leaf. And that, that's very indicative of a, of a pin oak. But a pin oak uh, produces a lot of acorns that are again, readily used by a, a bunch of different species. Waterfowl really like them. Because um, oftentimes in nature, not necessarily in an urban planting environment, but out in the, the natural communities, and you're going to find these in, in very wet conditions. They're going to be found along floodplains, along streams, on the edges of swamps and near ponds. And very oftentimes they're going to be in these riparian areas where those acorns can drop into the water or even on shore. Um, and, and waterfowl will come and, and kind of sneak those up. And um, I know I... Know I, I looked into it a little bit in Kentucky when I, when I lived in Kentucky, but uh, pin oak acorns were one of the preferred food sources for a lot of the, the wood ducks in Kentucky. And I know that that trend does still follow here in Illinois. So it's again, a great uh, wildlife food source. Up next is the shingle oak. And this is one of those that I referred to a little bit earlier that if you look at just the leaf, it looks nothing like what you would expect an oak leaf to look like. It doesn't have any lobes. It's just kind of this simple leaf uh, with an entire leaf margin. But if you look really closely, you will see bristle tips still coming off of that, the end of that leaf margin or the, the, the leaf tip, I, I should say. Um, you're, you're very likely going to find this on field edges and woods. It's kind of a a species that, that prefers disturbance and prefers open canopies. And so you're very likely going to find it right along the edges of habitats rather than kind of deep in the forest. Um, and it's one of these edge species where it really likes to, to get in the sun um, and, and, and spread that way. Um, the bark is kind of a, a dark brown with these deep ridges. So you can see in comparison to the white oak that we mentioned, this is a much darker color and it's also a much more uniform color. It doesn't have this kind of splotchiness or, or platy characteristics to it. It's just kind of your standard brownish um, trunk. The leaves are on average about six inches long um, and two inches of wide. And the acorns, again, are an adequate food source for, for lots of wildlife species. But again, this is one you're going to find a lot more on the fringes of the, of the timber stand rather than kind of in the heart of it, um, where you might find uh, some of the white oaks, northern reds, and southern reds and things like that. One of my favorite, I don't, I don't really know why it's one of my favorite. I think the acorn cap looks really cool on these, but this is the, the swamp white oak. Um, and 
you can think of it just like a white oak. It, it's got very similar characteristics, but it's going to skew a little bit more towards more wet soil conditions. Um, so you're going to find this in very low woods um, and swamps. The bark is going to be a, a little bit darker than the, the white oak, but if you look at the leaf here, you can see why it gets kind of the, the name swamp white oak. The under th This is the, the dead giveaway for this species. There's really no other characteristic to, to focus on, but the other underside of this leaf, you can see how just bleach white um, it is, and that's actually caused by they call it pubescence, so it's kind of a little hair-like projections on the underside of the leaf, and you can actually scrape those off with your fingernail, but that's kind of what gives it that white coloration. And so if you're ever you know, trying to identify this, just flip the leaf over, and that's going to give you a really good indication whether it's a swamp white oak um, or not. Um, the acorns are in pairs that are on stalks, and they have a, a very unique acorn cap. You can see how it kind of has these fringes instead of some of the other acorns that we've seen and that we will continue to see as we move forward. Um, it's kind of got these fringes instead of, you know, little little beads. They kind of look like little hair-like projections on the, the top of that acorn cap. Here's a, another uh, oak species that, that has a, a very unique acorn cap, and this is the bur oak. This is a species that's found statewide. Um, I haven't found a, a ton of it, but I also haven't necessarily looked for it. But it, it's got a very unique leaf. Um, you can see again, it's kind of your typical oak leaf, but if you look at these lobes, they're almost doubly lobed, especially these horizontal lobes that kind of come off the mid vein um, at kind of the, the mid level leaf, mid level of the, of the leaf. You can see that they almost have two lobes that, that kind of connect. And that, that's one of my biggest giveaways. Uh, but this is, this picture here is a, at the bottom is a pretty, pretty good illustration of the concept of sun leaves um, versus shade leaves. So these at the top, I would guesstimate those would be shade leaves, where if you see here at the bottom picture, you can see how thin a lot of these lobes are. And again, that, that's a pretty good indication that these are in fact sun leaves. But uh, this is a, a really unique tree. It's got very big acorns. Um, and again, just like all oaks, the leaves are going to alternate across the stem. It's not gonna be opposite. They're going to alternate. So you'll have one leaf per node. Um, and the, the hairy, kind of cap that that covers the the acorn will go typically about three quarters of the way the entire acorn as opposed to some of the other species that we'll look at um, if we go back one we can actually see the the swamp white oak has a similar fringed um, acorn cap but you can see it doesn't go all the way down that acorn it only goes you know less than halfway where in this case you're about three quarters of it is covered up by that by that acorn cap Another very common species that, that you're going to come across is the northern red oak. Um, it, it's a, a species that, that's kind of opposite of, of what we've been kind of talking about the last few with very wet soils. This is one you're going to find in very rich upland woods. You're going to find it along riverbanks as long as it's on kind of a well-drained slope. Um, so it can be in wet conditions as long as it has adequate drainage and water is not just kind of sitting on that, that soil for long periods of time. Um, it, it's got a, a dark gray kind of brown bark. It, it's very typical oak bark. Um, again, the leaves are going to alternate across the stem. But what I like to, to focus on for the northern red oak is just the, the size of this leaf and, and the way the, the leaf looks. Um, you can see it, it, it kind of looks, especially if you're looking at a sun leaf. So here on the right is a sun leaf. Here on the left is going to be a shade leaf. You can see how deep that these sinuses come on the sun leaf compared to a shade leaf. And that's why it's so important, as I kind of touched on earlier, is to be being able to identify um, whether it's a, a sun leaf or a shade leaf, because that can give you a, a ton of, of misleading uh, guidelines. But again, you can quickly tell whether it's a red oak or a white oak, just because again, it's got these bristle tips that come off the leaf point. So again, that instantly tells me it's a red oak. Um, and I know it's a Northern red oak just due to the sinuses. If we go back to the, the, quirk, the uh, pin oak, um, the sinuses are going to go in a lot deeper. And now there is a species that looks very similar to this leaf here on the right, known as the Schumard oak. Um, but you'll notice on the Schumard, these bottom lobes will actually come up and close off this sinus. And so this bottom lobe will actually come up overlap on this next lobe, and it'll basically close this circle sinus off. So if that sinus is still open, that's gonna be a Northern red oak. And if it happens to be closed, um, that's likely going to be a Schumard oak. 
Uh, but this is again one of the, those really good good acorn producing trees that um, I, I've had a lot of success hunting areas, especially for deer um, that have a, a high density of, of northern red oaks. They produce acorns at a, a really good pace. Um, the acorns are a decent size, um, and they again they just produce well in there and, and typically in advantageous areas where you're going to be hunting deer. Um, again, kind of a, in these up rich upland woods or along um, kind of well drained slopes. All right, we got another big oak tree here, but not the characteristic bark of that white oak. This one's different. The bark is more platy and uh, kind of flattens out between the fissures. There's no leaves really hanging on up there, but if I look around on the ground beneath it, I bet I can find one that'll help us to narrow down this IP. And we're seeing a lot of leaves down here with tips. So we know this is a red oak, and this looks like a northern red oak. So um, really reliable acorn crop from the red oaks. Not quite as palatable as the white oak acorns, but uh, really reliable food source. And another good one to know for all hunters and wildlife enthusiasts. And so you can see in that, that quick video, Curtis pointed out a, a really important aspect of, of kind of all of this. Um, especially when I'm when I'm you know planning hunts and I'm out there scouting, I'm I'm not always trying to identify it down to a species level. What I'm really trying to do is just be able, for me personally, I'm just trying to be able to distinguish between a red oak and a white oak. And uh, we actually had a, a really good comment from Troy. He said, "Red oak pointy tips makes you bleed blood, which is red. White oaks are round lobes. Think of a round snowball, white." Um, so maybe that'll that'll kind of help you remember it. That's a, a good little uh, tip there, Troy. But again, that that's kind of what I'm looking for. Again, it's not always can you take it down to a species level, but can you being able to to put it into a group? Because I, I promise you, if you start, um, especially if you're a deer hunter and you start paying attention to where you're seeing deer activity, whether it's in an area that that's producing a lot of red oak acorns or white oak acorns, it's going to start to tell you a lot about that that deer herds feeding habits. And that's going to be really important because uh, I, I mean, there's been times where the, the white oaks are going to get consumed rather quickly. And if, if you're not on top of the game, when that that food, you know, stuff switches, um, you may have, you know, four or five days where, where you're just not seeing a lot of wildlife. And oftentimes that's kind of right around rut where the, those females are, or those does are really focused on, on trying to feed and the bucks are just kind of harassing them as much as they can. Oftentimes the white oaks are, are going to be fairly consumed by that point. So that's when I'm, I'm really, I'm out there, I'm constantly looking for acorns, trying to identify, is this a white oak, is this a red oak? Are there a lot of white oak acorns still on the ground here? Um, and that's gonna, again, tell me a, a lot about how the deer herd is, is kind of using and, and feeding on that, that specific area. Now, moving away from oaks a little bit, um, this is a, a I, I call this tree um, a 70 mile per hour tree. So this is one of those trees, once you learn what it is, you're, you're likely never gonna forget it. And you'll be able to identify it going down the highway at 70 miles an hour. Um, if you've ever seen the, those TV shows or movies where they always have this kind of romantic scene with two high school sweethearts and they go to a park and they start carving their name into a tree, 99 times out of 100, they're doing that into an American beech tree. Um, <coughs> excuse me, you can see how smooth and uniform this, this bark is. It almost just looks like kind of sandpaper. Um, I, will, I will say, please don't carve your name into a tree. It, all it does is hurt the tree and it's gonna eventually, you know, be susceptible to disease and parasites and eventually die. So please don't do that. Uh, but that's how you can kind of remember the American beaches. It's one of those you've seen in movies um, fairly commonly. But again, it's got this very smooth kind of light gray bark that kind of looks like sandpaper. Um, it's, it's more so found on the eastern portion of the state. Um, so if you're on the western portion of the state, you, you'll come across them occasionally in more of a horticultural setting. They're, they're not kind of naturalized in the area, but some people do plant them in their yards and, and things like that. But you're typically going to find them in hardwood forest. Um, and the, the, the fruit is actually a, a small triangular nut that does get readily consumed by a, a bunch of different species. Um, squirrels love, love beech nuts. Um, but the... One of the, the key takeaways, aside from the bark, if, if for some reason you get to this tree and you still can't figure it out, there is very, very few species of, of trees that have leaves that look like this. 
Um, and if, if you look at it, you might, well, that's kind of a standard leaf, but pay close attention to how these veins come off of this mid vein. And you can see how parallel they, they run to each other. They're basically directly straight. They don't curve. Um, they're, they're, I, I call them fish bones because it, it kind of just looks like a fish rib cage going down there. Those, those veins are, are so straight and so parallel. Um, and that, that's very indicative of an American beach. Um, in the fall, now you won't see these leaves turn red, but they will start to turn yellow and kind of a, a nice pretty bronze color. Um, so that's kind of a, a fun fact about the American beach. Now, the next tree we're going to talk about is the pecan. Um, so if, if you're not familiar with how scientific nomenclature works, um, there's a, a genus and then a, a species. And I, I like to point this one out because it's Caria illinoisensis. Um, is the scientific name for the pecan. So it's kind of got that Illinois in, in, in its name. So it, it's very indicative of Illinois. And it's a really cool species. Um, it's typically found in very wet conditions on, on either moist woods or in kind of riparian areas along creeks, rivers, and, and streams. Um, the bark is going to have this kind of red to brown color underside of the bark. Um, so on the, the pecan, if you don't focus on just the, the coloration of kind of the outside of the bark, but if you try to look kind of through and into these cracks and grooves, you can see there's kind of this nice red, brown, coppery color. Um, and that's a, a pretty good indication of a, of a pecan tree. Um, now pecans are uh, pinnately compound. So if you look at this picture here in the bottom right, this entire structure here is considered one leaf. Um, so this is not, you know, a branch with multiple leaves coming off of it. This is one leaf with multiple leaflets. Um, and typically there's going to be nine to, to 19 of these kind of leaflets on each leaf. Um, if you were to zoom in, you would see that they are doubly serrated or doubly toothed. Um, they're going to be smooth on, on kind of the top or the bottom, but they're, they are typically hairy on the underside with kind of a, a nice copper hair. Um, it's kind of the, the same color hair you can see here on the on the fruit of the pecan the nut on the outer shell you can see there's kind of this light brown pubescence that's kind of covering that nut um, that is still present on the underside of the leaf as well and again uh, like almost all hickories um, this is if, if you're interested in squirrel hunting these are the trees that you're really going to be focused on are going to be the the pecan and the, the hickories um, they're they're really good for that and uh, squirrels love 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 them uh, but up next is the, the black walnut. Um, if you've ever had a, a black walnut, you know, at your, your house as you were growing up, we've all tried to play baseball with them, and we've all seen that they kind of stain your hands, and, and that, that toxin just kind of, you know, stains your hands, and it takes, you know, a solid week almost to, to remove a, a lot of that dye. Um, so black walnut is a, a tree that has a lot of history in this country, and it's been used in countless different, you know, projects and countless different um markets. Um, one of the, the common uses for it today, especially by, by trappers, um, you can actually use the, the, the black dye that is in the nut. You can take that black dye out and use it to actually preserve and dye some of your traps. It's kind of a rust prevention technique, but it also helps to kind of darken them up a little bit. Um, so there's a, a lot of uses for black walnut outside of just eating it. And of course, the wood is, is very high quality and very expensive and, and very sought after. Um, but the, the black walnut, um, again, is another pinnately compound. Like most of the, the hickories, the black walnuts and the pecans are going to be, they're going to be pinnately compound. So again, this whole structure here is a single leaf um, with multiple leaflets. Now the, the leaves are going to alternate across the stem. The leaflets are going to be opposite on the leaf. But if you're looking at how the leaf is arranged on the stem, it will be alternate. Um, each of the leaflet is, is toothed. Um, the fruit is going to be this kind of thick husked nut. Um, and there's actually a, a real interesting toxin that black walnuts are basically secrete in the, in the soil. So the term is allelopathy. Um, there's a few other tree species that, that's out there that, that does this and a few other plants as well. Uh, but that's, that you've probably heard, you know, whether it's through an extension or, or through just kind of reading through Facebook or things, but you're not supposed to plant black walnut near a garden or near a, a lot of other vegetation because it's going to, to slowly secrete this toxin into the ground, which is going to basically limit plant growth nearby. And so it really restricts other plants' ability to uptake nutrients. And so it has this unique ability to basically just clear off anything around it. Um, so this is one that's typically not recommended to plant in kind of a, 
your yard or you know next to a garden or anything like that. Uh, but again, it is a, a very valuable wildlife resource, um, and it's a, a pretty easy tree to identify once you kind of see these these fruit. Um, the fruit will remain on the ground for a long period of time. They'll, they'll start to decompose, like you can see here in the ground or here in the bottom. Um, well, these these aren't actually decomposing; these are just kind of ripening and drying. But as that husk decomposes, you'll still be able to find a lot of remnants of it, and so that will be pretty evident. Um, on the, the soil in the forest. The next one is the mockernut hickory. Um, so this is a, a tree that, that is very commonly found in very dry wooded slopes. Um, it, it's a very shade tolerant tree. And so you're gonna find it deep in the forest and, and shaded woods. Um, it, it's not, again, you can occasionally find it out along the edge or out in the open, but typically you're gonna find it again in very shaded areas as it's a very shade tolerant species. Um, it's, it's found commonly in the southern two thirds of the state, but the, the big giveaway for the, the mockernut hickory, or even if you're just looking for a, a hickory in general, so all hickories are going to be pinnately compound. Um, so it's gonna be just kind of your standard leaf like this with, with multiple leaflets on it. Um, the mockernut hickory is gonna have about five to nine leaflets, um, but the, the way that I am able to identify a a mockernut hickory is due to its level of pubescence or level of hair-like projections on the, the leaf. Um, so if you were to, to have this, and you can kind of see it here in some of the, on some of the, the pedestal and on some of the leaves as well, but if you were to have this leaf in your hand and, and we're examining it and flipping it around, you would see that almost the entire structure is just covered in, in hair um, or hair-like projections. And so that, that's why it's, it's really easy to identify also, the, the nut is kind of one of our biggest hickory nuts, um, especially the, the husk of that shell is very thick. It's about a quarter of an inch thick where some of the other species are, you know, maybe a 16th or a 32nd of an inch thick. But this is a very thick, uh, thick hull on, on this, this, this nut here. Another species is the shagbark hickory that I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about the white oak. Uh, but you can see how this species gets its name. And this is, again, one of those that, that I kind of call the 60 mile per hour tree because there, there's very few species that have bark like this. Um, and you can just see how that bark is basically just slowly peeling away from that, that trunk. And that's a, a dead giveaway um, for the, the shagbark hickory. Now, a white oak also does have a tendency to do that. But remember, a white oak is going to have a, a simple leaf. It's not going to be pinnately compound. And it's also going to have lobes on the leaves. It's not going to be... Uh, you know, an entire leaf. Um, and also the, the fruit is going to be a little bit different. But shagbark hickories are, are a really good resource, especially for um, squirrels in the fall. They, they will readily consume these nuts like, look, it's, it's crazy. Um, they, they, they love shagbark hickories, but they're also used by bats. Um, same with, with white oaks as they have kind of these plate-like pro projections. Uh, bats can actually get up and roost in these, these kind of crevices and use that as a roost site. Um, so that's just kind of a, a fun fact there. But the shagbark hickory, what you're looking for here is focusing on that bark. Um, that, that's going to be kind of the, the dead giveaway. Once you are, are able to identify that it's a hickory by looking at the pinnately compound leaf, by seeing the fruit, and then if you're able to, to get a good look at the bark, you'll see that it's kind of, again, just slowly peeling off. And it's always peeling off kind of upwards. So you can see how these, these plates are kind of curving up and out instead of just kind of staying down and staying uniform across the, the trunk of the tree, they're going to kind of bend and, and fan out a little bit. But this is, again, a really good tree to, to pay attention to if you're a squirrel hunter. Now, I will give a, a quick caveat. If you're a deer hunter and you like to hunt out of a, a climbing tree stand, I do not recommend trying to, to hang a tree stand in a shagbark hickory because, um, again, all this loose bark is just going to inevitably, you'll start slowly falling down. Uh, to a point where it may become dangerous. So stay away from, from hanging a tree stand in a, a shagbark hickory, uh, but it's a, another really good tree to pay attention to uh, for, for squirrel and for a bunch of other, other species as well. All right, well, oaks aren't the only big trees in the Illinois woods providing some mass for all the critters out here. Uh, shagbark hickory, which is pretty aptly named with all the the bark kind of shagging off of it there is another great um, wildlife food source and a tree that's fairly easy to ID even in the winter or early springtime.
Now we're going to move into maples. I'm going to quickly turn it over to Adam. And he's going to dive into this. But one thing I, I just want to point out really quick, um, now that we're kind of transitioning off of, of oaks and hickories, so now we're, we're going to focus on maples. And if you think back to our earlier conversation about leaf arrangement, I mentioned that, that one of the, the few family of trees that, that is always, always, always opposite is going to be your maples. Um, and so as we're, we're kind of going over each of these species, just remember that that means there's going to be two leaves per node and they're going to come off opposite of each other on um, the branch. And one thing I, I should also point out, and I, I wish I had a, a picture to illustrate it, but this concept of opposite versus alternate, you can also see in the, the way that the branches are forming on the tree itself. And so if you look up at the tree and you see they're kind of alternating off of the branch, you know, the, the, the smaller new branches are alternating, that's going to mean it's an alternate tree and, and vice versa. Uh, but again, for, for maples, we're going to be thinking opposite. Um, so take it away, Adam. Thanks, Dan. So yeah, we're going to go over some other trees there. Uh, commonly found in the woods. So we're gonna uh, first start off with the red maple. So uh, red maple, you're gonna be looking at, uh, as Dan mentioned, opposite leaves. They're simple. Uh, they're generally pretty uh, small, uh, especially compared to the other maples we will go over, uh, but they have about three to five lobes, um, super distinguishable with the red stem off the leaf. Uh, Almost all red maples you see have that. Um, and also a few other characteristics. It's a fairly small to medium sized tree and the, the, the bark is super smooth and usually pretty uh, light gray. Uh, whereas some of the other maples we'll get into have uh, a lot of different features. So um, also here in the picture on the bottom right, uh, that is the fruit it produces. So, a lot of people call those helicopters, but the proper name uh, is Sumeras. Super good for small game, birds, um, squirrels especially, um, but you see a lot of small game eating those and taking advantage of those, especially during the summer. Um, and these red maples are found, uh, you can find them about anywhere, uh, sometimes in bottomlands, a lot of times in edges of streams, uh, and even in upland forests. So moving on to the silver maple. Um, so this, off, right off the bat, if you see in the background, the bark uh, is a little bit more shaggy. There's a lot more characteristic to it if you look in the top picture. Um, again, they're going to have those sumeras. That is the fruit. Uh, the leaves on this one are also opposite, simple. Um, they are a little bit bigger. And if you look at this bottom picture, you could see the uh, deeper cuts into the lobes as well. That is a super uh, big uh, characteristic on silver maple, as well as the bottom of the leaf, again, is super light colored. So you have a pretty dark green top side and, and that silvery bottom side of the leaf. So another way to, to identify that. And most of the time you're gonna find these in bottom land areas. Um, they grow pretty large um, and they have a pretty round crown um, and pretty slender uh, spreading branches. And I believe the next slide is a good video of an example of the silver maple. Well, here's kind of an overlooked tree when it comes to wildlife, but one where the buds really stand out. The entire tree, all the ends, the terminal ends of all the branches are just loaded down with these large red buds. Letting us know that this is a maple tree. Um, like I said, one that's overlooked for wildlife, but those buds are an important food source um, and one that can be easily identified this time of year when the, when the buds are really popping. Yeah, so in that video, you guys were able to see the bark was a lot more shaggy than um, a red maple. So again, pay attention to that, but moving on to uh, black or sugar maple. Um, so again, the leaves are going to be opposite and simple, uh, about uh, three to six inches long, again, three to five lobes, um, a very broad, wide leaf, um, pretty unmistakable when you see them. Um, and if you look at the Sumeras on these, uh, the sugar maples, 
a lot dark, uh, a lot smaller and really dark green. Um, again, wildlife really like those over the summer. Um, you'll see squirrels feasting on those uh, regularly. And yeah. And I, I will jump in real quick, Adam, and just kind of, I, I want to highlight that the, the black slash sugar maple is actually two separate species. Um, when you, when you get biologists together, there, there's kind of two schools of thought. There's a group of what, what some will call lumpers, and there's some that are called splitters that like to split very specific groups, you know, and very specific in how they define what's a species versus a different one. So the, the, the black and sugar maple are very, very difficult to identify unless you know exactly what to look for. And what you're going to look for is you would flip the, the leaf over and look at the underside of the leaf. And if it has hairs, um, it's going to be a black maple. And if it doesn't, it, it's going to be a sugar maple. Um, again, for us as, as hunters and kind of a, a beginner course, that's that's something you don't necessarily need to look for. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to, to highlight that. Awesome. Thank you, Dan. So next up, we have the Eastern Red Bud. Um, this one is super easy to uh, find, especially in the springtime when everything starts blooming. You can see those really bright uh, pink flowers on them. Uh, very common in central to southern Illinois. Uh, you can find these as kind of ornamental trees too around town and people's yards, uh, but usually found in deciduous woodlands or rocky woodlands, river valleys. Um, another key characteristic is the leaf. Uh, it's really uh, heart shaped. Uh, so you can take a look at that and, and that can sometimes give it away. Unfortunately, we don't have a good uh, bark picture to show you, but also a uh, keynote for the bark in the middle of the fissures uh, is a very distinguishable uh, salmon pink color too. So that's another thing that gives away the red bod. Um, and yeah, so mainly look at the flowers, especially in the spring and summertime. That's a good way to tell them apart. Up next, we have the wild black cherry. Uh, so this one's gonna be scattered around the woods as well. A lot of times along uh, wood edges or fence rows, uh, somewhere where there, there's a little bit more thicker cover. Uh, the bark is really thin and smooth. Um, the leaves are arranged alternately and about six inches long. They're fairly um, uh, not smooth when, to the touch and you can uh, see the teeth edges around um, around the leaf and of course during the summertime you're going to have your wild black cherries uh, and when they're blooming you're going to have those white flowers popping off off the branches as well and one one really cool way to identify this tree is by looking very closely at this bark you can see how it has these kind of horizontal like stripes across it um, these, these are called lenticels essentially but if, if you look closely at, at wild black cherries you'll see these horizontal uh, kind of lines that that run along, you know, along the bark, and that that's a really good indication of of wild black cherry. And also, if you look at the leaf tip closely, um, it's probably hard to see in these pictures, but if you were to look at the the tooth um, or the the serrations on the leaf, there's actually going to be kind of white dots at the very tip of of that leaf tip, um, which is a, another good kind of indication that it's a wild black cherry. But typically, when I'm looking at a black cherry. It's one of those trees that you can just, once you learn what this tree bark looks like with these horizontal kind of lenticels running across um, and kind of parallel to each other, you'll be able to pick that off uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Yep. Awesome, Dan. Thank you. And here we also have the hackberry. So these are going to be uh, found statewide, usually in bottom woodlands. Uh, one of the easier, in my opinion, trees to identify by just looking at the bark. Uh, they're going to be very light gray in color and really warty. Uh, you'll see this all the way up from the bottom of the tree all the way to the top of the um, trunk. Uh, they'll do just be very warty, uh, very hard to the touch if you try to, uh, you know, to feel the bark. You can't really smush those down at all. Super um, uh, distinguishable. And again, I would also recommend to not use any climber stands on these trees. It can be a very loud uh, and they do tend to get a little bit slippery if it rains. A um, Couple more distinguishable things on the hackberry. Uh, your leaves are gonna be alternate on the stem. Um, leaves are uneven at the bases. 
Uh, and then the fruit on them ripens in September and October and small game birds and even deer really like these as well. We're in central Illinois in mid-March and the forest is just waking up. For the most part, uh, most of the trees that we're going to be able to identify um, going to have to do that kind of looking at bark alone. Now on most of these trees the buds are popping pretty good so that can give us clues but we're not going to have any leaves or leaflets yet unless you can find some old ones that are hanging on the tree. So let's see what trees we can identify just by their bark here in the upland. First off, right here by the disturbance, I'm seeing some real warty and knotty barked trees. Um, these look like hackberries. If you're having and trouble then, hearing the audio thumbs or hackberries in this uh, distinctive bark that's kind of flaky and is going to be the wild the black cherry around it. Tree. Oh, sorry, I don't know what's happening. Okay, I think we're back. And darker than most of the trees around it. That looks like a black cherry tree. And then if I move around here to the end, I find a real tight diamond pattern on this tree, telling me that it is probably an ash. Let's go a little bit further and see what else we can find. And like Curtis mentioned, this is going to transition nicely into our, our next species that we're going to cover, which is going to be ash. If you look very closely at this bark, you can see that it's got a, it's got kind of this diamond pattern. I mean, you have to kind of struggle to see it occasionally, but here's a, a really good diamond here that you can see. Um, there's there's diamonds throughout, and it's just got this real unique kind of lines of, of fissures and ridges that oftentimes form diamonds. Um, there are several different species of ash. Um, we're, we're just going to kind of cover ash in general. Um, and th this specific example is going to be the green ash. Um, the leaves are going to be opposite, very, very much like the, the maple. However, these are going to be pinnately compound leaves. And so they look a lot like hickory. But remember, these are opposite where your hickory trees are going to be alternate. Um, these leaves are, are about 8 to 12 inches in length. Um, and, and they're going to have about seven to nine leaflets. These seeds um, that you can see here at the top are called, again, Samaras, or essentially winged akeens. So there's one seed per um, Samara that you're seeing here. And they're very commonly eaten by, by songbirds, by quail, by turkey, by wood ducks, uh, by pretty much every small mammal you can think of. But this is also a very common species that's browsed upon, especially in its younger growth stage is very commonly browsed upon by, by deer. So the deer will feed readily on the, the young twigs, uh, the buds, which are gonna be your new growth, um, as well as, as some of the leaves. Another species that, that we're gonna talk about is the American elm. Um, so this is a, a, a tree species, if, if you're interested in morel hunting or, or finding morel mushrooms later, you know, we're, we're getting close probably a, a few weeks away still, but if morels are on your mind, this is a tree species that you want to pay extra attention to. Um, it, it's very commonly known that, that morel mushrooms are, are very commonly found along, right next to or, or growing on dead elms or, or even in the soil near elms. So if you're interested in morel mushrooms, uh, pay, pay a little, little extra attention to, to this um, tree. But this is the, the American elm. And if you think back a few slides, I mentioned there was a tree species that we were talking about, the beech, that has this very unique kind of parallel fish bone type venation coming off the leaf margin. Um, that's again going to be fairly common on the, the American elm as well. But what gives this away from the heck or from the beech is going to be looking at the bark. Obviously, it's not that kind of nice, smooth gray bark that the beech has. It's got just kind of your standard your standard bark with with kind of you know dark gray brown with these deep kind of crossing ridges that you kind of see here in this crossings um, and even even down here uh, but these are going to be doubly serrated and so you're going to have one big tooth on the leaf margin with another smaller tooth kind of inside of that that bigger tooth so this is going to be considered doubly serrate now there are uh, several species of elm in illinois there's the american elm um, the slippery elm, the red elm, um, but they're, they're, they pretty much all look fairly similar. Um, but the, the slippery elm 
for some reason it's it's not very slippery but the, the leaf is going to be fairly rough on the american elm where on the the slippery elm it's going to be a little bit smoother um, but on here if you were to rub the the top side of this american elm leaf um, it will feel like a, a very fine grit sandpaper it's not a very smooth leaf it's it's very rough um, the, the twigs and the buds are going to, you can kind of see this zigzag pattern that, that kind of forms here along the, the twig. Um, that's going to be very, very common across uh, the American elm. Um, the fruit, very similar to the, the maple, it's a, a Samara. Um, and they're kind of this small, flat and yellow thing. They can also be kind of greenish and red. Uh, but again, primarily fed on by, uh, by, by songbirds and other small mammals. But again, if you're interested in morel mushrooms, uh, pay pay special attention to to seeing an American elm in the in the forest. And another really indicative feature of an American elm is just the overall structure of the tree as it as it matures and as it grows. Um, so you can see here in in this kind of example here in the top left. Obviously, these are planted in kind of an urban planting setting, uh, but this is still fairly common even out in, in bigger uh, stands of timber. Is this this tendency to have very a very wide trunk but then it kind of immediately splits into to multiple big trunks right off the base instead of having you know, a, a long trunk that goes kind of straight up in the air and then kind of spreads out. It, it seems to, to always want to spread out fairly close to the ground. Another species that we're gonna talk about is the, the smooth sumac. And so this is one I would wager a guess every single one of you has, has seen, um, whether or not you realized you've seen it, but if you're ever driving down 57 or 72 or even you know any of the, the big interstates um, during the, the springtime, you're going to see this fruiting structure here in the, the top right. You're gonna see that very, very common along roadsides. Um, I, I mentioned a, a few species back that, that one of the species was a, a kind of it preferred disturbance. It likes open areas. Um, the, the sumac is, is dead to rights that. It, you're typically not going to find it in the woods. It's going to be more so found on kind of the fringes of a prairie or kind of a, an overgrown area, but it, it likes disturbance. So it's not going to be in an area that, that just kind of shaded out by trees. It needs that open canopy um, to, to be able to grow and, and to thrive. Um, now, if, if you're, you know, you get to this tree and you still can't figure out, you know, what is it? Um, there's a, a really good technique um, in, in kind of dendrology and kind of the, the identifying characteristics of trees to look for. If you were to break the stem on one of these, these trees, so obviously this is, again, a pinnately compound leaf, so this is the entire leaf. But if you were to break a part of the twig, it will actually secrete a very white kind of milky sap. Um, and that, that, again, can give you a pretty good indication that it's a, a smooth sumac. There are a few other species that we'll cover um, that, that do possess that, but they, again, they won't have this fruiting structure and they won't also have the, this pinnately compound um, leaf. Now, I will say um, deer and, and rabbits will readily browse the, the snot out of things, um, but Native Americans, there's actually kind of a, a unique history to the, the sumac in, in North America. And these were actually used very commonly to make a a lemonade type drink. And I know there's still some people that do it. Um, I've never personally done it. I've never really looked into it, but I know it is it is an option that Native Americans um, loved making the, this kind of lemonade type tea drink that was very sweet and very sugary um, from this, this fruiting structure. Another very common species that you're gonna find readily alongside disturbance, you, you'll typically find in the same areas that, that you're finding the, the, the sumac that we just kind of talked about. And again, along roadsides, on all logging roads, um, things like that. But this is the, the mulberry. And so there's a, a couple different species here, but I, I want to identify a new term. Um, so th this term that I wanna identify is called polymorphic leaves. And so if you look at this specific tree or this specific picture in the top right, you can see you basically have three distinct leaf types. Um, and that, that's again, polymorphic. And so it's very common to have leaves on the same trees that look completely, completely different. Um, but the, the nice thing about the mulberry is obviously it's got a very similar fruiting structure to say a, a raspberry. Um, they're, they're very good to eat. I, I commonly pick uh, mulberries quite a bit um, during the spring, um, but Again, it's common along edges, along disturbance. It, it likes those open canopy type areas. 
Um, and again, like the, the smooth sumac, um, this also does secrete a white milky sap. And on this one, it's even a, a strong enough sap that if you were to just break and rip off a leaf and kind of rip a leaf in half and look closely at it, it will actually start secreting that, that white milky sap as well. Um, so this is the mulberry. And again, it's a very common species that's browsed on by a multitude of species. And that, that berry, once it's produced, uh, pretty much anything that, that eats fruit on a regular basis uh, will consume the, the mulberry fruit. Um, another fruit to, to kind of pay special attention to and, and maybe to, to stay away from is the persimmon. Um, now, if, if you can time it right, persimmon is one of my favorite wild fruits that are, that are commonly found in Illinois. But if you have, have never eaten a not yet ripe or an unripe persimmon, it gives, I don't even know how to describe it. It, it is the, the most cotton mouth I've ever experienced in my entire life. Um, it, it, the first time I took a bite, it probably took two hours for that cotton mouth to, to kind of clear up. It's just so bitter and so tart that, that it, it's, it, it, it gives you cotton mouth for quite a while. But when it's ripe, it's a real nice juicy fruit. Um, there's a lot of people that make jams and jellies out of out of persimmon. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, uh, persimmon's a, a great option for that. Um, but it's going to, again, produce this kind of orange to orange purple fruit that deer will love, especially in the spring. Um, I know there's a, a lot of people that, that will put up trail cameras kind of nearby persimmon trees um, or, or kind of even on persimmon trees just to, again, get kind of a, a quick overview of what deer happen to, to make it through the winter. Um, it, it seems to really draw out the, the deer herd. Once the, the persimmon ripen and start to drop at a, a fairly standard pace, um, deer are going to, to consume them, them fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, but in addition to, to deer, you know, it, it's eaten by basically every species that, that's out there will feed on, on some aspect of the, the persimmon. Uh, it's a, a really cool tree. Um, and one, you're, 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 you'll eventually come across, there's not a, a substantial population in Illinois, they're certainly fairly common, uh, but you kind of have to go looking for them. And you're typically going to find them in kind of more open, dry areas. They're, they're, they're typically not going to be found in very moist, moist soils. Um, occasionally, you'll find them on kind of slopes as long as it's a fairly well-drained slope um, that, that doesn't have, again, that, that water that just kind of sits on it for a, a long period of time. Up next is the sassafras, and I think this is one of the, the coolest trees. If, if you've never found a sassafras tree, um, I implore you this spring to just go walk around the woods, especially if you're somebody who, who likes to smell unique smells. Um, if you've never stumbled across a sassafras tree, find one, grab one of the leaves and kind of roll it up and crumble it in your hand and give it a, a big smell and it will smell like the sweetest bowl of fruity pebbles that you have ever smelled in your life. It is the, the strangest thing, uh, but, it, but it, it smells just like fruity pebbles. And so if, if you ever get to a tree and you're not sure, um, you can always, you know, take up a leaf, crush it, smell it, see what it smells like. And if it happens to smell like fruity pebbles, well, it's sassafras. Um, but like I, I mentioned a little bit earlier with the, the mulberry, I introduced this new term called polymorphic leaves. Um, this is, again, very common on sassafras. You can see we have basically a, a simple leaf that's circular. We have three lobes here. We have one that kind of looks like a mitten. And then we have this one that's kind of a, a bigger three loaf, kind of looks like a dinosaur foot. Um, and so, again, this is one of those trees that has multiple leaf shapes um, on, on the tree. Um, the, the leaves are, are alternating across the stem. They can either, like I mentioned, be unlobed, two-lobed, or even three-lobed. Now, the, the dead giveaway um, for the sassafras, in addition to the, the smell and this kind of polymorphic nature of the leaves, is it's considered what, what I call is a, a green twigger. Um, and so if you're, you're looking at the twigs, um, these twigs are actually going to be green. Um, most trees, there's a, a few others that'll be green, uh, but they, they won't confuse you with sassafras. Um, but most trees are going to have kind of brown twigs. This one will actually have green twigs on, on that newer growth. Now, as that newer growth gets, you know, a year or two old, it will start to turn brown a little bit. But if you look into this year's growth or even last year's growth, you'll be able to see those green twigs. And that's going to give you a really good positive um, ID. Now, historically, sassafras, if you've ever heard of the drink sarsaparilla, um, sassafras is actually the, the main ingredient in it. It's, it's actually um, part of the, the root system. And it, it kind of makes like a, a root beer style drink. Um, there have been studies that have shown that it is uh, somewhat carcinogenic um, and cause cancer. So I know there, there's been some efforts to, 
to stay away from there. But if you've ever heard of the term sarsaparilla drink or, or that kind of thing, that, that comes from the, the sassafras tree and comes from those roots. Um, and if you were actually to, you know, ever have to, to cut down trees and one of those trees is sassafras, you'll notice a, a very strong kind of root beer flavor from the bark, but it's also going to be bright orange underneath the bark. So if you were to just kind of scrape off a little bit of the, the bark on the outside of the tree, you'd see it's kind of this nice, pretty orange color um, on the inside of the bark. Um, it, it's commonly, again, found in savannas, woodland edges. Um, again, it, it's kind of one of these species that's fairly shade um, shade intolerant, so it, it likes to be out in full sun, likes to be out in the open, uh, but it's a, it's a very cool plant. It produces a, a berry that's readily consumed by, by birds, by, you know, small mammals and, and other things like that, but a uh, cool plant, the sassafras. Another cool tree, I guess, to, to some extent that, that you're likely going to come across is the Osage orange, or, or some people call them hedge apples. Um, these are a non-native tree. Um, they provide fairly minimal wildlife benefit in terms of the, the native wildlife in Illinois, because again, these are non-native. They're brought over, or I think they originated in Asia. Um, I, I can't recall, maybe Curtis can correct me on that if, if I'm wrong, uh, but they were transported and brought in and now they're starting to spread. They're, they're not necessarily considered invasive like some of the other species like honeysuckle and multiflora rose, uh, but they are a non-native that doesn't have a, a ton of natural wildlife benefit to our native wildlife. Um, now, one of the, the, the dead giveaways for the Osage orange is going to be this, this fruiting structure. That fruiting structure is going to stay on the ground for, for months even after they produce and they're still going to be in the trees. But also if you look at the overall unique structure of the tree, now this, this tree does not get big. Um, it gets what I consider robust, so it gets kind of wide and dense, uh, but it doesn't have a lot of vertical growth. So it gets kind of to a, a certain point, like 30, 40 feet, and at that point it just starts to, starts to kind of broaden out. Um, there, there's a, a real popular Illinois DNR uh, public land site here in central Illinois called uh, Weldon Springs. It's got these things all over the place and in some of the, the bottom lens there. Um, and it, it's, it, it's taking over those woods at a, at a pace that the DNR has actually come in and started to remove um, some of these trees just because, again, they don't provide a ton of wildlife benefit. Um, so if you ever stumble across, you know, Osage Orange and it looks like they've been cut down or what we call girdled, which is just kind of taking a chainsaw and doing a 360 degree circle around the trunk um, that will eventually kill that tree and cause it to die. Um, so if you ever see that on Osage Orange, that's kind of why is again, because it's a non-native that, that provides fairly little um, wildlife benefit. But I will say I was hunting that, that site um, late, late winter for, for deer. And I actually did have deer come by one of these Osage Orange trees and they were actually kind of pawing and, and chewing on the fruit. Um, I couldn't tell how much they consumed and, and how, you know, obviously how nutritious it was for them. Um, so they, they will kind of play around and eat, with, eat them, I guess, if they, they need to, uh, but it's certainly not a, a desired species. This is another one of those that I call the, the 70 mile per hour trees. This is the American sycamore. Um, fairly, you know, typical, typically shaped tree. It's going to have a, a long, you know, trunk that this is one of those trees in direct comparison uh, to the last one. This one has a, a ton of vertical growth. And so that trunk is going to go up and up and up and very commonly, it may be 40 or 50 feet up before you see kind of that, that first horizontal branch coming off the, the main trunk. Um, so this is one of those trees that gets really big, really tall, and has a ton of, of vertical growth. But the dead giveaway on the sycamore um, is going to be looking at the bark, especially the bark towards the upper half of the tree. Um, so you can see how that bark basically just falls off and exposes this kind of light tan to almost white um, underbark. And that's going to be pretty much evident across uh, the entire top half of the tree. Now, if you were just focusing on the bottom half of the tree, um, it's still going to have kind of that, that same typical bark that you can kind of see here on some of the, the bottom of the tree. Um, but uh, this is a, a fairly cool tree and you're going to see it a lot. Um, the, the, the unique capability, not capability, but the unique tendency of sycamores is that when they die, um, they very commonly produce giant cavities inside of the tree. Um, and those are very commonly used by raccoons, by other, other, you know, other squirrels and, and other mammals uh, to use them as, as shelter and as well as birds. Uh, but this is, again, one of those 70 mile per hour trees. Um, I, I don't pay much attention to the leaf on this. It is a, an alternate arranged leaf that's kind of simple. It doesn't have a ton of serrations. Uh, but once you see that, that characteristically white, white bark on the top half of the tree, 
um, that'll give you a pretty good idea of, of what it is. Another species that we're going to cover is the river birch. So this is another one that's a fairly quick identification. Um, you can see that it's, it's kind of found mostly across the state. Now, this is a very, very, very wet species. Um, and you can kind of tell that by its name, river birch. You're going to find this basically right alongside of floodplains. Um, you're not going to find it far outside of the, I would probably say the 10-year floodplain. Um, past that, the soils might be a little bit too dry for it. But inside of that 10-year floodplain, uh, you'll find a lot of these in riparian areas, right along streams, along creeks, rivers, um, and even some ponds. Um, if they have a, a connection to, to an area that already has some, you may find them there. Uh, but the dead giveaway on the, the river birch is this very paper-like bark uh, that just kind of slowly peels away um, from, from the tree. And this is a tree that, again, it's kind of a, a I would medium size to, to small size tree. I, I would say it's more on the small side um, than the medium size tree, typically about 30 feet. Um, and you can see it, it doesn't get a ton of girth or, or growth either. It's just kind of the small understory type tree. But again, it's going to be found right alongside of riparian areas. So it likes very wet, very, very wet areas. Another tree that you're going to find right next to river birch is the black willow. So this is a, another species that, that likes about a wet soil as you can find. Um, it doesn't necessarily like standing water year round, but it certainly does like a lot of wet soil and a lot of wet conditions. Um, but this is the, the black willow. And the black willow is, is one of those trees that once you figure out what it is, you'll see it everywhere. Um, it's got this very unique tendency to have, you know, fairly big branches, but then just hundreds and hundreds of these very small branches that just kind of come off and look like just kind of a, a mess of, of dense twigs. Um, that, that's very indicative of the black willow. Uh, but if you look closely at the leaf, you can see it's a, a very slender, very long leaf. Um, this picture actually makes it look a little bit wider than it is. Um, typically, they're, they're about, you know, the, the width of, you know, a, a kitchen knife or so is about the, the kind of standard width of a, of a black willow leaf. Uh, but again, a very slender leaf found along wet conditions, um, and they, they are found all across the state. Another kind of understory type small uh, tree that I want to highlight is the flowering dogwood. Um, now, the flowering dogwood is, is obviously a, a very pretty tree, but it also tells us a lot about spring. And so if you're an avid bass fisherman, um, this is a tree that I pay attention to. And you may be like, what, fishing and pay attention to a tree? But what I have noticed and, and what's been written about for, for several years now is once spring really starts to, to come on strong and the, the flowering dogwood start to flower, it's very similar to the exact same time that the largemouth bass begin their spawning. And so once you start to see, you know, flowering dogwoods begin flowering, that's when I start to trend. OK, maybe I'll start thinking about bass fishing a little bit. So if you're interested in fishing, uh, you can pay a little more attention to the, the flowering dogwood. But the flowering dogwood, uh, the leaves are going to be opposite um, along the along the stem, and they're going to be fairly small leaves, and it's a fairly small tree that doesn't get a ton of growth. Um, typically, it's not going to get much, much wider in diameter than, you know, say a, a big soda can. Um, on average, you can occasionally find some that, that are pretty robust and, and pretty decent size, but very commonly, you know, they're going to be 10 uh, feet or so. Um, in, in size, but the, the fruit is kind of a, a red berry that's about a half inch long, and it's actually kind of a, a cluster of fruits, uh, but it's very commonly fed on by just about every songbird species that, that comes through Illinois on its migration path will we'll stop and, and kind of feed on the, the flowering dogwoods as they're available. But now we're going to dive into to some of the gymnosperm, so I'm going to turn it over to Curtis really quick, and he's going to take us through a, a couple of the, the gymnosperm species that are important to, to highlight. All right. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so far, everything we went over has been what we call flowering plants, right? The angiosperms. But first, we had the gymnosperms, the naked seeds. Uh, these are what we commonly just kind of group and call the evergreen trees. Um, and luckily, in, in Illinois, we've only got a handful of them that are pretty uh, commonly find, uh, found out in the wild. Now, of course, in cities and landscape, you're, you're apt to see just about anything. But uh, we've only got a, got a handful you can find out there. And probably the most prevalent all around is the eastern red cedar. Of course, the... Uh, you know, the tree that's kind of famous for 
uh, when fire is suppressed, they kind of encroach out on the prairie and try to turn the prairie into a red cedar grove. So um, yeah, you've probably seen that if you if you think about it, but um, you know, these are pretty easy. These are, uh, there's male and female Eastern red cedars. So when you see the female trees, you're gonna see these little uh, glaucous kind of waxy um, berry looking things. They're not, not berries, but um, actually they're, they, they call them juniper berries. These you can actually collect and, and it's a great flavor with uh, venison. So a uh, nice little tip, yeah, if you collect a bunch of those and dry them up, save them, uh, uh, pretty good flavoring to use to add into venison. And you'll see a lot of different recipes that utilize those. Um, and yeah, you don't, uh, I don't even know if you can buy them, but you can certainly go out there and, and collect them. Um, and of course, a great thing about um, red cedar is just real good thick cover, especially uh, winter cover or like it's been for the past couple days with the gale force winds blowing um, a nice thick stand of red cedar is a good way for critters to get out of that wind. If we move on from the red cedar this might be one you might be a little less familiar with but uh, bald cypress this is one only going to be found in the in the wettest places and especially the marshlands and this is one, if you're hiking around the lowlands, uh, you may curse this tree, not because it has any sort of thorns or anything like that, but if you notice in this top picture, it grows these knees or uh, the roots, instead of just growing out laterally, they actually poke up. And that's, a, that's an evolutionary trait so that they can actually get uh, up into the air and, and do um, gaseous exchanges even when all the roots are underwater for long periods of time. So really cool adaptation, but really a bummer when you're trying to walk through the marsh carrying 60 pounds of decoys. So uh, keep that in mind. And I, I when I was a kid, I used to take the, um, you see the little, um, on the bottom, they look like alien eggs. Yeah, we used to pull them off and tell the, the younger kids they were alien eggs and don't get them wet or a, a gizmo or a gremlin will hatch out of there. But <laughs> they kind of look like Brussels sprouts, kind of cool little things. But um, I think the most diagnostic thing about the, the bald cypress is the bark. You can see it a little bit in that top uh, picture, but it's got a real um, thin, blocky, uh, appearance to it. And then, of course, if you see those knees coming up all over the place, uh, those um, upward projections from the roots, you know you're dealing with a bald cypress. And I, I, I will say, I, I've noticed in the past few years, especially around the, the, Champa the Champaign area, there's been a, a lot of people that have started planting bald cypress in their yards as ornamentals. Um, now, obviously, I'm not an urban forester, but I would you know, if you kind of saw this, you're like, oh, that, that's a cool tree. I would caution that because uh, just like Curtis said, the, these knees will poke out of the dirt and then you'll be, you know, trying to mow over those knees constantly. <laughs> um, so just kind of keep that in mind. All right. And now one that a lot of people don't like too much, um, bush honeysuckle. So this is real common uh, pretty much anywhere with disturbance. Um, a lot of times you're going to find almost the entire understory made up of bush honeysuckle. Um, uh, real aggressive. It can kind of choke out everything else. Um, introduce. Yeah, it does have little berries that, uh, that some animals will utilize, but in general, it's probably not as good at uh, feeding the wildlife or providing cover as our native species. So a lot of times um, the goal is to sort of knock back or try to eradicate bush honeysuckle um, and restore native plant communities. Um, so you will see efforts uh, to do that, but yeah, you're going to find it everywhere. And I think the, the biggest thing that stands out to me, especially this time of year, so obviously we don't have those bright red berries, we don't have any leaves on there, but you can see, and we don't have a, a real great picture of it. I 
tried to get a video, but it didn't turn out. But uh, the the bark and all of the um, branches have these uh, basically lines that run um, along the length of the branches. So it's almost like pinstripe. And that really stands out this time of year. So if you're looking at a bunch of understory little bushes and uh, they all look pinstriped, you're probably looking at bush honeysuckle. Hey, Curtis, uh, we have a, a question or, or kind of more of a, a correction. Um, Angela says that bald cypress lose their, their leaves in winter, and that is correct. Um, you, you may have just misspoke, but yes, bald cypress are one of the, the very few conifers um, that actually uh, shed their, their kind of needle-like leaves. So uh, thank you for correcting us, Angela. Yeah, it's a good point. I um, was going to say that and I skipped over it when I went through. I think it's the only one here that uh, that does. I'm not sure on that. Okay, grapevine. So now earlier we had the poison ivy vine, the hairy rope that you don't want to grab. These are generally less hairy ropes and uh, these a lot of times you'll see um, people call them the big Tarzan type vines that you see uh, in the woods but uh, a lot of different variations they're all I think by TCA um, all different species of grape they have kind of this big leaf very diagnostic shape it almost resembles like a big maple leaf type pattern but shaped a little bit different but obviously this is a, a big vine um, you can find these anywhere. Uh, mostly you're gonna find these uh, more towards the edges and sometimes they will be really big, heavy, stout vines, but uh, not nearly as, as hairy looking as our, our smaller poison ivy vines generally are. And common blackberry, another little tasty treat. Once we get into the, the dog days of summer, um, you can go out there and find these. And there are thorns on, uh, on blackberry or black raspberry or any of those little fruiting plants you can find, but they're not quite as bad as rough and tumble as the, the multiflora rose type uh, to thorns. So generally, these are a lot easier to tolerate. And um, if you hit them right and get there before the the birds and the squirrels and the rabbits and everything you might get some tasty little blackberries to eat um and blackberries that's going to be pretty common when you uh, a lot of people will call them raspberries but one easy way to tell when you get to the actual berry part and you pick that off if the whole thing uh kind of comes with it it's a blackberry, whereas uh, raspberries are, are just caps. So when you pull them off, you'll leave sort of the core uh, will remain attached to the stem and, and just sort of a bowl shaped uh, fruit will come off of there, which um, is actually a, called an aggregate. But anyway, tasty little treats. I don't know, probably about um, July when you can start finding fresh ones out there. And sometimes we get a second, uh, usually get a second push towards the latter part of August or September too, where you can get out there and pick some blackberries and uh, save them, put them on your ice cream, but you'll be competing with a lot of different critters because that's definitely a, a sought after food source for a lot of our, our native species. All right, and now we got just a quick little quiz here. We're gonna go over um, just a couple uh, plants and you can answer. It's it's uh, obviously just um, as you wish in the uh, chat window, but we've got multiple choice there. Do you think that this tree in this video is a white oak, a green ash, a bald cypress, or a beech, an American beech? Ooh, that bark looks pretty, pretty smooth to me. I'm not driving 70 miles per hour, but uh, yeah, I'm thinking, I'm thinking you're right. It's a beech tree. All right, this next one, here's another specimen. You all think this is a Eastern red cedar? 
a shag bark hickory, a white oak, or a red oak. All right, with that very diagnostic white uh, bark that looks a little tattered, a little worse for the wear, that certainly is a white oak, one we, we should all be aware of. And we got one more little tree here we'll try, maybe a little bit harder this time, we'll see. Doing pretty good so far. All right, now here we got two right next to one another down here by the stream. And I know the, the video is a little bit choppy here in the live Zoom. When you watch the recording, it'll be a little bit easier. But I am seeing some real persistent red buds, uh, even through the, the uh, kind of choppy video there. So do we think these might be silver maple trees, a white pine, um, a American elm, or an African baobab tree? And yes, these are a tree planted in a lot of our yards, a little bit brittle, probably have to pick up a lot of limbs, a uh, silver maple tree. And just since I threw in the African baobab, I like to throw out one little quick, uh, cool piece of trivia, potentially the oldest living tree species in the world. Uh, but because of the uh, climate that they live in, they don't produce annual growth rings. So they have to date the baobab tree by doing um, more of a carbon dating technique that's less accurate. So it may be the baobab, uh, but here in North America, we've got Pinus longeva uh, or the bristlecone pine that I think officially holds the record. Um, and they can be multiple thousands of years old. It's a high elevation uh, pine tree that grows in the Western US. So pretty cool, that's my, my end end of the quiz, end of my trivia. I'll turn it over to Dan to take us home. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Curtis. I, I actually think the, the probably the, the longest lived tree in Illinois would probably be a bald cypress, I would guess, because they, they readily reach, you know, five, 600 years. So off the top of my head, I would say that probably, probably accurate. Um, but yes, uh, so I, I again just wanted to, to thank everybody for, for coming out tonight. We hope you, you learned something. We hope you, you ha had an enjoyable evening with us. Um, we do want to highlight a, a couple of our upcoming webinars that we have coming up later this month. Um, we have Turkey Calling 101 on March 23rd, where we're going to break down the different call types. We'll do some uh, live demonstrations on how to, to make the different vocalizations. And we'll also do kind of a, a deep dive into turkey vocalizations and what each specific vocalization means and how those turkeys are, are using it to, to kind of communicate to each other. Um, on March 25th, we're going to do a, a deep dive into archery equipment. So if you're brand new to hunting and brand new to archery and, and maybe you want to, to learn a little bit more about, you know, the different bow types, different arrow types, uh, different materials, how to paper tune your bow, how to get it set up for you, um, join us on March 25th and we're going to do a nice deep dive into um, into a, a nice archery equipment. On March 31st, we're gonna start kicking off our, our deer hunting series. So we're gonna start off with Deer Hunting 101 on March 31st. That's gonna be a, a, an overview of kind of regulations, an overview of deer ecology and deer behavior, um, and then as well as some equipment and some hunting tactics. And then uh, as we progress through April, uh, we'll, we'll probably do a, a few more webinars in April that are kind of catered to deer hunting uh, since the deer lottery is currently open. Uh, but after that, we'll probably be uh, starting to, to make our transition back to in-person workshops. And so if you're you're new to the Illinois Learn to Hunt program, uh, we primarily host in-person workshops, hoping to get you the hands-on skills necessary to get out in the field comfortable and to, to try to harvest your own food. Um, and so, you know, obviously with, with coronavirus restrictions, we had to shift a lot of our efforts online, uh, but we're in the process of, of getting back in gear to, to get back these in-person events. So uh, stay tuned to our, our various social media channels, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, um, YouTube, or our monthly newsletter, and you'll, you'll be able to stay up to date on, on all those events. Uh, but we are planning a, a few events, what we call our, our family outdoor days. And so if you have young kids or maybe grandkids and you want to bring them out, we're going to have multiple stations um, with archery set up, with shotgun shooting, hopefully with some um, pellet guns, um, as well as a, a fishing station and maybe a bow fishing station. 
Um, so, so just kind of stay tuned. Those, those should be a lot of fun. Um, just kind of, again, bring out the whole family, get them all engaged in an outdoor activity. So if you're looking for something to do, uh, we're starting to, to plan those for September. Uh, but again, we'll probably start our, our typical learn to hunt workshops that'll, that'll start uh, probably in May, I, I assume, is, is when we'll, we'll be able to get back up and running. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but with that, if we have any questions, we have a, a few minutes. Um, we can take questions. But if not, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, looks like we, our first question is, what role do trees play when near ag fields? Will deer prefer ag or walnuts, acorns, etc.? cetera? Um, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. It, I hate to say it depends, but a, a lot of it depends. Um, particularly on the, the the seasonality of of your question. So if you're asking it, let's say in September, um, then they're really going to still be focused on those those crops since the, the acorns are going to be producing. But once those acorns start producing, you're typically starting to to see a big impact in the ag landscape as well. They're they're kind of synonymous. Very often, the acorn drop corresponds to a lot of the, the the corn and soybean harvest. And so typically you kind of see this almost mass exodus from feeding, you know, typically in a lot of these ag environments to switching more into the, the thick cover where they can stay safe. Um, so I personally, I don't hunt a lot of agriculture type um, setups when I'm deer hunting. I, I personally like to focus on areas that are more conducive for cover are more conducive for um, does, e you know, e regardless whether you're hunting does or bucks, I always try to find where the does are feeding. And that that's going to tell me a lot. Cause again, as you get closer to rut, you know, towards Halloween, as, as rut starts kicking in and the, the bucks start chasing a little bit, they're going to want to be where the does are. And so I'm going to try to find doe bedding areas and try to figure out where they're going from those bedding areas. And typically that time of year, it's going to be in a lot of, of uh, timber type feeding where they're going to be feeding on acorns, particularly if you're on public land. Um, so I exclusively hunt uh, public land. I, I don't hunt any private land in Illinois. Um, so that, that's probably why I don't have a lot of ag, to be honest. Um, but on public land, you know, you, you get this perception of pressure, hunting pressure, and that pressure just starts to drive deer a little bit further into the woods. And very commonly when it does that, it's going to shift their feeding pattern. So even if they're still feeding in the agricultural fields, a lot of times what I've noticed in, in my hunting experience and hunting scenarios is oftentimes that's going to be after shooting light or before shooting light, where if I can find a spot they're feeding in the woods, typically that's going to be a little bit closer to their bedding site. And so hopefully they're on their feet and still feeding during those, those active shooting hours. So I typically prefer to find nice oak flats, um, whether you find a, a nice series of white oak flats on top of a ridge um, that's producing a lot of acorns. Um, very commonly, you'll find white oaks kind of on the, the, the top of a slope, um, and those acorns just have this tendency to kind of roll down into the to kind of a, a creek bed. And one of the, the places I, I had a lot of success hunting this year for deer was in a, a dry creek bed, and it had kind of white oak acorns basically on either side of the ridge, and all mm -hmm. those acorns just dumped on that slope and kind of drained into that, that creek. And so it just provided a real nice feeding area um, for deer. So typically... I prefer to hunt a, a little bit more of the natural food rather than the corn and soybean. Uh, but again, a lot of that is due to, to the, the public land as well as just how hunting pressure impacts uh, deer movement. But great question. But with that, I think we'll close it out tonight. If you have any other questions or think of anything else in the, the next, you know, month or two or you know whenever uh, feel free to reach out to us through facebook instagram youtube um, email we'll be happy to, to chat with you and you know either provide you some some more resources um, or or even you know give you a quick phone call and try to talk over some some things so thank you for joining us tonight and have a, a wonderful evening